Thanks very much there, Julian. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, I've just flown in from Perth. You know, the weather in Perth was pretty wild and bumpy. When I came into Sydney, the weather's not much better. But I tell you what, when you look outside Australia and you look uh, around the world, obviously we're in bumpy times. And what do you need in bumpy times? I'm going to go through this and, and try and put our, our story to you. At the moment, just this week and over the next couple of weeks, what have we got? We've got the Greece election. You know, this is quite a, a big event. Uh, we've also got consideration of the future of the euro, which has also got considerable impact upon investment decisions going forward in world markets. You look back at Australia. Obviously, we're all here. We're all investors. You look at the energy sector. You look on the, uh, this is the index for the energy sector, the index stocks, all the bigger stocks, 32% down for the last 12 months. This is from July 1 until uh, last week. We look at the mining sector, 37% down. Material sector, 41% down. So obviously, it's been a tough year. And uh, when you have a tough year, when you have the indexes going down like that, what it does is usually then it creates, uh, you know, some people are underwater on various investments, and so you look to sell, and you have your June tax selling. And we've probably seen a bit of that. Maybe it was May or April tax selling, because we've seen the markets going down. So what is all this creating? This is creating an environment where um, you're not buying at the peak of the cycle. If you're all strategic, longer-term investors here. You're, you're, you're looking at the macro picture and you're, you're coming into value and you may be coming into value quite quickly as you move through June and you move through the next couple of months. When times are tough and when it's uh, tricky, when it's uncertain, what do you do? You go back to basics. You want to invest in real things. Uh, there's not a lot of future really in putting all the money in the, you know, under your pillow or in the bank for the long run. So you've got to look at the real stuff and what do you want to invest into? Energy business is, is one of the biggest businesses in the world. Uh, it's like uh, you sell energy today, next day people come back and buy more energy. It's like Mr. Remington and his shaver. Every day you shave, next day they shave. It's a consumable, it's a huge business. We all use it. Every day we use more of it. So uh, you look at, um, in the energy business, obviously gas, oil, these are both you know, significant players, but the biggest sector of the biggest energy supplier in the world is coal. Uh, you know, it supplies a, a significant amount of the cheapest energy uh, throughout the world. Uh, and the big drivers for coal, similar to big drivers elsewhere, but it's, it's, long t it's the development that's happening through Asia. This is the prime driver. In, in Pan-Asia, this is a, a Peabody analysis just here. But what it shows is, it looks, this is just an example of China. And uh, you can see the energy uh, intensity usage per person in China, down there, 2.2 tonnes of coal per person, compared to a fully developed country. We know China's just coming up the development curve. Uh, many other developing companies, uh, countries are coming up the development curve. Every day, 200,000 people, they leave the, the farms, they leave the rural areas and they head to the cities. On the planet, 200,000 people every day. When they come into the cities, what do they want? They want everything that we've got. They want to, they need, they, and for that, they need energy. Energy drives development. Development's happening. There's a big structural shift around the world. And uh, Australia, Australian listed companies with expertise, with access to capital, we're uniquely positioned to really take advantage of this big structural shift. Um, we operate in Indonesia at the moment, but we're hooked into China, India, etc. And um, if you look at this, uh, in Indonesia, the actual energy usage per person is one quarter of, uh, of what it is in China. So they've got further to go up the development curve. What all this shows is we've seen commodity cycles in the past, and there have been three, four year cycles. What we're really showing here is that the commodity cycle at the moment is a long structural one. We're going to see periods of six months, 12 months where it softens off. But we really believe that this is a long-term uh, activity and probably you're looking at a 15-year-plus type cycle. This is through China, a longer cycle in Indonesia, etc. So what, what sort of coal are we in? We're in thermal coal. We're in uh, Indonesia, in Kalimantan. Kalimantan, this is the number one thermal coal exporting region in the world. There's a couple of reasons for that. Look at its location. You can see its location here. These are the big markets. This is China, this is India, we know Japan, Korea. These are the four big boys. Also in the ASEAN region, we have Thailand, we have the Philippines, both uh, significant coal importers. This over here is an interesting thing. Another advantage of Indonesia, this was in the Australian newspaper just last week. And so I picked it up, you know, we know this, but it was not nice to see the updated figures. 
What's the cost to develop a mine in, actually in China, it was $48 a tonne. Indonesia, $56 a tonne. Canada, 90. South Africa, 99, because they're getting deeper. Australia, at the moment, such a, a, you know, a dominant coal com country in the world, it's $141 a tonne. It's unfortunately becoming very expensive to do coal uh, in Australia, and you have to look, where are these big, big buyers in India and China, where are they going to source this coal? They're going to keep sourcing it from Australia, but they're going to have to look for future supplies from, cheap, from places that have the coal and that can develop it more cheaply. Uh, what's our strategy? Our strategy, we, we, when we went into Indonesia, was a little bit different from everybody else. Uh, we don't go in looking for the mega project, you know, the, the multi-billion tonne coal project. If you have a, a multi-billion tonne coal project in Indonesia, if you don't have a big partner from Jakarta, you're going to find him or he's going to find you. If you have a really tiny project, it's a lot of work, you know, every taxi driver when you get off the plane in Balikpapan offers you four projects. They're all useless as we know. In the mid-tier, there are some really interesting opportunities in the mid-tier. These are projects that can give you 100 to 500 million dollar uplift as a company, and they're projects that you can apply uh, a reasonable level of effort to, and you can get a very good outcome. In Indonesia, it's got the pluses, it's resource rich, it's well located, lower costs. One of the shortfalls that it does have, it doesn't have a sophisticated stock exchange. The Jakarta Stock Exchange is very similar to the Singapore Stock Exchange, similar to Hong Kong in a different way. The Asian stock exchanges typically can raise significant funds for projects that have already reached the development stage uh, or, or they need expansion. If you're looking to raise money at the risk end where you come in and you drill, uh, then the Australian Stock Exchange, the Resources Exchange, we are the most sophisticated exchange up there with the, uh, with the Canadian Exchange and to a lesser extent the South African and UK. But you can access risk capital. We spread the risk around by investors in our listed companies. But we also have Australian mining and exploration standards. Australia is a wonderful mining country, probably, we say, the greatest mining country in the world. And we have great expertise, we have great um, discipline, and we have a process that we work through when we bring projects up. So what we do in, in Pan-Asia, we look for mid-tier projects, we bring our, the mining discipline, the expertise that we have in the company, we uh, access that risk capital, we seek projects that that we can drill, we can add value to by drilling. And then what we do is we end up with a project where we've taken it, where we've got a jork resource, we take it through feasibility, we clean up all the titles, we get all the permits, we get the environmentals, get the whole thing in shape, and then we look for our big offtake partner. If you've got a, if you've got a big energy project and uh, it's all de-risked, it's ready to go, there's a big line of people in China and India, etc., who really want to get access to that long-term reliable supply of coal. And uh, that's, that's where we fit into the cycle and that's where we can add value. This is our uh, flagship project in South Kalimantan. We have a 75% interest in this project. Uh, you can see that picture. One picture tells, uh, you know, uh, a thousand words. This, um, this is an open pit which is mined right up to our boundary. That open pit is owned by Bumi Resources, the biggest mining company in Indonesia. It's a subsidiary of theirs called Arutman. Arutman has a 20% subsidiary, uh, is 20% owned by Tata out of India. It's a, it was a beautiful target for us because it's high CV coal, very high value coal. All the infrastructure's in and uh, they'd mined up to the boundary where it got too deep. Uh, that's where they'd stopped. Uh, our partners in Indonesia, technically driven people, picked up this project, said, look, clearly the coal seams run over the boundary, they keep going. And, uh, but how do we access the risk capital? We got involved with those guys a couple of years ago. We've undertaken all the drilling, we've done all the permitting, we've taken it through a production license. Uh, we've drilled up so far 128 million tonnes of jork uh, measured indicated inferred resource and uh, at the moment we've only drilled in the bottom half of this licence and uh, there was a fault through the middle so we thought well that's enough, it's a big enough area and it is a big enough area and that mine we're going to start up in the south but as we speak we're still drilling in the north, uh, we've drilled uh, five holes in the north so far, we made that release this morning and uh, every one of those five holes so far we've hit coal. Uh, by the end of uh, July, we expect to complete that drill program. If we get holes in those, if we get coal in those last three holes, we're very confident we're going to increase that resource from 128. We're targeting in 200. Infrastructure is great. 51 kilometres an existing uh, haul road down to the barge loading terminal uh, in Batalichin. 
Uh, that's the breakdown uh, just of the measured indicated inferred. We've actually gone past this phase now because we've just recently completed the full final feasibility study on the project. It's a production IUP, Pan-Asia, even though we've got a 75% uh, interest in the project, we keep the offtake rights. It's very important when you go to deal on the project, uh, which is a, with the key for unlocking value, uh, it's very important to have the offtake rights. We speak for 100% of the sale rights of all the coal. And there's just the, uh, the photo, just the, uh, the image there showing the haul road down to uh, the barge loading terminal in, in the sea there. Uh, just a project overview, this is what's come out of the feasibility study. This was done by COPEX, one of the biggest under, underground mining groups in the world. They completed this feasibility study just two weeks ago, so it's a very fresh baby for us. We've been working on this a long time. Style of mining, it's going to be a mechanised long wall. Target sellable coal, about one and a half million tonnes per annum. That's what we can sell after washing. Uh, we'll be mining probably about two million tonne per annum. Mine life, 15 years on the southern sector. Uh, we're confident that we might be able to extend that mine life even another 10 years, but 15 is more than enough for starters. Uh, the, we've done a lot of work on the coal washability. The optimum uh, coal spec for us is about 6.2 gar. Uh, for people who are not really in the coal sector, uh, that's pretty close to Newcastle spec. So it's uh, similar value to Newcastle spec. It's kind of 100, you know, the last year that was $110 coal. You know, it's probably down at the moment. Last week, Newcastle spec, I think, is about 92. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a good high value uh, product. Uh, the operating cost per tonne, uh, that's taxes paid, royalties paid uh, on the mother vessel, about $52 a tonne. That's what the feasibility is showing. CapEx, OpEx, pre production, it's a chunk of change, $190 million to build it. Half of that's all just the, the, the hard equipment, the underground mining equipment. Uh, they've run the NPV at 11% WAC is uh, US uh, $130 million. So uh, there's a photo of the haul roads. You can see there's excellent haul roads, excellent infrastructure. Uh, just back up a little bit why it's time. Now, how did we come to Indonesia and pick up this really nice project? And it's sort of it's a similar question to what Barry asked, uh, I think, uh, um, Michael before. And if we were in Indonesia 15 years ago, we would have picked up a first generation project, right? First generation projects, you get 100,000 hectares of land. You get you know, outcropping coal, you get open pit coal, you've got uh, good infrastructure, it's near the coast, low strip ratios. It's a slam dunk project. Uh, the companies, the big Indonesian companies that picked up all those holdings 15 years ago, they are the major companies, Indonesian companies in Indonesia at the moment. All those projects are gone. There are no big ones of scale, of that quality, available for foreign groups to enter. Uh, second generation projects are where people have moved further east into the middle part of Kalimantan. Typically, they're still looking for open pit. You've got longer haul barging. Sometimes you have to put in rail lines. Uh, you, you may have lesser coal quality, which means you need, may need upgrading. Alternatively, uh, one of our very friendly companies, Cocal, they've got a project, a you know, second generation project. They've gone for coking coal in central coal, so they've got a very high value product, and that offsets their hauling. Uh, all viable style of projects and second, second generation projects. What have, what have we been targeting? We came in and we looked at it thought, well, look, you know, we've been in this mining business for a fair while. Uh, where's the opportunity for us? And uh, we looked around and we thought, well, look, the best thing is let's go right back next door to these first generation projects where we can get big tons, we can get high CV coal with the infrastructures, excellent because it's near the coast. We usually pick up free infrastructure because there's usually an open pit mine there already, which we can hook into. What are the barriers for entry? CapEx is higher. Uh, mining OPEX can be higher. Uh, but another one of the, uh, the big pluses is, like all mining companies, we compete for ground, right? In Australia, we compete with farmers, we compete with indigenous groups, we compete with, with uh, development, right? And so uh, in Indonesia, we compete with forestry. Uh, you can, it's a fairly populated country, so you're competing with people on the surface. It's part of the business of being a mining energy company. So uh, the nice thing about underground mining is it's got very little impact because you've only got a, a, a small surface disturbance. And the Indonesian government's just recognised this and is now providing incentives to encourage you know, people coming in to uh, overcome the, uh, the hurdles for uh, underground mining. You know, the, you know, the big picture, what do you look for if you're looking for an underground coal mine in Indonesia and anywhere? You want high quality coal because it gives you high revenue per tonne. You don't want to go into an underground for you know, a low revenue per tonne coal. You want big tonnage potential because you've got bigger capital investment. So you can write that off over a bigger tonnage. 
Location and infrastructure, you, got, you, you, you typically can get good location and infrastructure, that offsets your higher mining costs. Other the technical things you look for, good rock integrity, you know, that's important in Indonesia. Indonesia has got, as we know, it has a lot of volcanoes, it has a lot of earthquakes, most of the islands. It's got a long history of underground mining in the outer islands and, uh, and gold, etc. But uh, it's shaky and you have to know what you're doing. In Kalimantan in particular, uh, Kalimantan is stable, so you don't get the, you don't get the shaking and the, and the earthquakes and the tremors, etc. But what it is is the rock is softer in Kalimantan. So everybody's been taking the low-hanging fruit in Indonesia, the, you know, where you don't need the big capital investment, you don't really need to know, you know, you don't have to have that expertise that you bring to an underground mining project. And, uh, but this is one of the things we have to look at as an underground, as a company, we bring in people who really understand the rock integrity. We've done a lot of work through the feasibility, understanding the rock integrity, and uh, we're signed off on all of that. You don't want too much faulting because we want to do this in big scale. We want to do it as a mechanised long wall. Uh, if you've got faulting, just basically it means you can't get big, nice, wide panels. It's not as efficient. Uh, in our project, we've got, uh, we can do the nice, wide panels. We've drilled it and we understand the faulting. You don't want too much parting and you don't want too many gas, water, spontaneous combustion problems. All of these things are normal parts of operating underground. And uh, we've done all the testing for those and we have all the measures to handle all of those. Who's our partner uh, on this project at the moment? Uh, COPEX, you know, as I mentioned, I think earlier, one of the largest groups in the underground uh, sector out of Poland, number three in Europe, I think, in underground, operate in over 50 countries. Uh, they've been doing uh, underground trial mining in Kalimantan. They came into Indonesia and Asia about uh, uh, four or five years ago. They looked at their growth prospects in Europe as being limited. They thought Asia is a place where they can really grow their business. And uh, in Indonesia, they've, they've targeted about seven big underground mines that they want to pitch. They want to sell, sell all the mining equipment. They want to operate them. And uh, they looked at our project, and they actually want to participate in our project. And they've been providing co-funding on the drilling, just so that they can have a preemptive right to be the guys to be involved with us. Um, so they bring a great capability. Uh, and we may, we may well do a deal with COPEX, at least to a part or, or further. And I'll come to that in a little bit further. Uh, so what have we got at the moment? We've got uh, 128 million tonnes jorked. Our share's the attributable target there, 75% of that's ours. Uh, expiration target, a little bit of it might be open pitable on the boundary, so that's good. The bulk of it's underground. TCM North, which is the, the northern half of our licence, uh, we think we can bring that up to 200 million tonnes. We think we'll have that drilling, we'll be finished by end of July. And by mid-August we'll have the coal quality, we think we'll have a substantial upgrade coming out by uh, mid-August. So it's all live. Uh, this is put out by an independent broking firm here in Australia. They got all of the coal companies. They worked out what's the average enterprise value per tonne. How do you value a coal company? Uh, a lot of these are done on coal companies pre-getting uh, into production and pre-feasibility. So you've got expiration. The average value is about 46 cents a tonne. Uh, down here, that's averaged over all of these companies. Uh, once you're into development production, you get up to around two dollars a ton. You know, just under two dollars a ton. Target market cap for us, you know, for Pan Asia, you know, we're we're targeting to be at least a fifty cent stock by Christmas, right? So, and that's based upon the valuations here. We've got an MPV on the project of 135 million. We've got a 75 percent interest in that. We think this is a pretty realistic target. We're well undervalued at the moment, and we'll come to that. We've got 117 million shares on issue. It's a nice tight structure, very few options, most of those that are premium. Cash, not a lot. So how are we going to do a $190 million investment when we've got $1.5 million in the bank? Pretty simple. Our model was to develop the project up to the point of feasibility. We then go and seek a development offtake partner on the project. Even though the feasibility only came out two weeks ago, we've already got two groups. One of them, obviously, COPEX, who's publicly out there that they want to be involved in the project. I leave here tomorrow for Jakarta. I meet with COPEX to receive their proposal uh, on Friday. And um, we have uh, other groups that have already started the due diligence. Already, they will be coming forward, we expect, to one other group within a month. Uh, on Sunday, I go to Beijing. I've got uh, meetings with two state-owned enterprises in Beijing. Uh, for, to talk to them about the possibility of coming into our project. 
We've probably got, in a short space of time, in a couple of weeks, since the feasibility is out, we would have another at least half a dozen you know, strong prospects you know, from different parts of the region. All people interested in buying coal and seeing a project that's had all the risk, most of the risk taken out of it. So uh, why don't we need the cash? We're going to do a deal on the project, and we're going to do a deal on the project in a way that, one, we get cash back, and two, that cash value just gets pushed into our company and it forces the value up. So we think we're pretty close to a serious re-rating. Uh, here's our time frame. The base case feasibility study just out. Feasibility study optimised. We put it out to an independent group here in Queensland to say, OK, how do we optimise it? COPEX did the study. Are they being too conservative? They want to come into the project. So that will be optimised over the next uh, month and also for the, the, the drilling that we're doing on the border. We're looking for an in-principle commercial agreement over the next three or four months, uh, a completed deal. We'll pick the best group out of the ones that we're talking to, and we expect all due diligence on that project to be completed and settled by the end of the year. So in the next six months, uh, we really think we've got some serious stuff happening. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we are negotiating on a second project, you know, a similar style of project. And we want to get our foot, we're the guys that are pioneering this out there with COPEX. We want to get our foot on this other project so that before we do this deal and we add all the value to it, we've got the next one. Team, you know, some of you may know Dominic. Dominic was CEO of Deloitte uh, National uh, Body, uh, chairman of Sydney Gas. Myself, been in resources forever. Um, Chip Chip, he's our, um, uh, one of our partners on the 25% on the interest on the underground project. He's also the coal appraiser for the Jakarta Stock Exchange, very serious, very conservative guy, you know, knows everything about coal in Indonesia, and he brought this project to us, and he's our partner. We also have a terrific team in our office in Jakarta. Our main operating team is in Jakarta. We have good commercial people, good financial people. We have a great uh, technical uh, team, uh, Indonesians, and we can assess any new opportunities really within days, uh, just, just uh, through experience in-house now. So we've really built it over the last couple of years. So summary, you know, we think we're in the right commodity at the right time. Uh, we're uh, feeding into the markets where we expect to be long-term demand. Uh, we can see immediate demand for what we're doing, immediate appetite. We've got a project that's just had its feasibility study come out of the closet, so uh, we've got the asset, the baby's born, we just don't know where, it's, we don't know if it's a big baby, we don't know if it's twins, but uh, we don't know who's going to end up uh, uh, as our partner on it, which is maybe interesting, but uh, it's coming. We've got high priority exploration, we're drilling in the northern half, uh, that program will be finished end of July, and uh, so mid-August we expect to have a, a re-rating project opportunity pipeline. We're well down the track on talking on another one of these. Great in-country team. Our partners in Indonesia are aligned with us. If we make money, they make money the same way we do. We're inexpensive, market cap under $20 million at the moment. We've all been compressed down as everyone has. But um, we'd say uh, uh, it's a good value time to be looking. There's a lot of great uh, investment opportunities. You, uh, but we'd just like you to consider us as one of them. And we think uh, yeah, we've hit most of our milestones, all of our milestones in the last two years. Macquarie's, I don't think the Macquarie guys are here tonight. I was talking to them this morning. They were very happy. They understood they bought 20% of us on market. They're great uh, you know, supporters. They understand the sector. And they said, look, you've hit all of your milestones and just keep going like that. And you know, this, the year should finish off quite well. All we need is a level market out there. But uh, that's all for now. Thank you very much.